so yeah, well, thank you for the invitation. Um, really nice, especially pleased to see uh, Rive Chao's work earlier on. Uh, my name is Iveruki. I'm part of um, Troika. Um, um, we started working together about 15 years ago. And I want to take you through some of the things that we have done in that time, and in particular, the immersive installations that we have made. Uh, I've entitled this talk Ways of World Making After Book by um, a friend of ours, experimental filmmaker Ben Rivers. And I thought that there was a certain overlap in the way that we are creating alternative uh, realities and offering slightly ambiguous narratives. And in, of course, our uh, installations have I'm that way different that you become the protagonist quite often as you can walk literally into them. Um, but there's also a certain way of editing quite often involved um, in the way that we choose what often falls into the range of your perception and what falls outside of it. Um, by, way, by way of introduction, these are Connie and Sebastian. <coughs> Uh, with whom I've started working in about 2003. Um, we work uh, in East London in a studio underneath the railway arch. <coughs> These are some images um, of it. We basically kind of make every or all of our installations ourselves. And that feedback loop of um, the physical making and the concept for the next work is a really important part of our work. Um, but first I want to go back to a really, really early work that has made quite a journey with us through the last 15 years. Um, this little object was originally part of uh, Sebastian's graduation project and it was called the Electroprobe. And it has gone through several iterations with us. So this is a little sort of pick up um, mic that um, transforms the electromagnetic waves of electronic objects into sound. So it started as this uh, singular object and it was kind of a tool for exploration where people would go and find um, objects and sort of discover their parallel lives. And then we gradually moved to building these soundscapes around the objects, which are completely still when you would first see them, but then with the help of the electroprobe, you could discover all these um, sort of bubbles and giggles and almost like small talks that all these objects had. <laughs> it has gone um, has through various different forms and formats. This here is an installation where we have made um, a loop, a physical loop. go back to this image so we have built the installation here into a physical loop as well what you see in the middle is a big speaker uh, that would be slowly rotating the electroprobe um, is affixed to it and all these different objects 
wherever we have brought this installation were um, sort of fairly site specific. So the first one were the items of a small flat all piled on top of each other. Here we went to the various electronics markets um, around town. What was quite interesting, this is from a solar installation actually, exhibition in um, Korea. And in the museum, there was this massive um, lift right next to the room in which the, uh, this installation was shown. And what was quite nice is that it actually also picked up on the sound of the, of the lift and of the space next door. So it became a little bit more site specific than we thought it um, would be. Um, so in a way, it's almost a certain filter. It's kind of expanding all your perception and adding a sense that you uh, don't have and in which makes you able to perceive these sort of internal lives. What we found quite interesting as well is that the objects that we chose, they were pretty much all obsolete. There were a lot of old um, computers and screens, outdated phones and whatnots, but all these uh, objects, of course, still have their own internal life and although they are no longer sort of functioning for us, there is still almost an alternative um, landscape and ecosystem out there. Um, yeah, that um, can still be yeah, considered very much alive in there. This is another um, immersive installation. Uh, quite a different approach, I suppose, because this is not so much about expanding your senses, but a lot more about uh, providing you with a filter and removing a lot of um, uh, what you could maybe call a reality. Um, these are a couple of close-up of these water streams. So the space that you saw just before is an art foundation in Bogota. It's about I think, 200 square meters. And we flooded the entire space and put these sort of stepping stones across the space where people could go and explore the space in, in various different areas. There were these um, water drops falling from the ceiling, but if you approached them, you actually realized that were, they were somehow reacting to or behaving according to a different um, sense of time. So there was one in the beginning which uh, seemed to be going really, really, really slowly down, like almost in, um, yeah, in slow motion. Then there was an area further in the back where you would stand, actually pretty much where she is standing, um, where you would be surrounded by these five, like super minimalistic or minimal interventions, but yet uh, they were all sort of rising um, around you. So we try to offer this um, alternate reality here where you really had to yeah, sort of navigate of what, what you believe, you see what is real, what is not. Um, I think what was quite interesting is that we, uh, people could really yeah, well, touch it. It's really, it's just water. In that sense, um, that, uh, the light was very much dimmed in the space. I mean, this bit here is um, what we call the prototype. <laughs> so we prototyped the stream of water in our studio. And um, I mean, as you can probably tell from the recording, the light is slightly fluctuating. So it's, uh, you know, it's uh, using persistence of vision, um, which is you know, when you see the car wheels, the movie's turning backwards. It's kind of the same thing, but for, to us, the um, interesting part was that we were here exchanging um, film by reality. So we um, treated an actual like element such so as basic um, as water in the same way other people would treat 
um, a recording. In the space itself, there was literally no sound because we had uh, dampened all the sound of the water dripping from the ceiling because of course it gives you a kind of sense of rhythm and a sense of time which is something that we wanted to completely eradicate so it should be this sort of slightly abstract space which was actually very very calming and contemplative in the way we use the stepping stones um, as a way to slow people down because we knew that there was only five centimeters of water in this space but because it was uh, sort of uh, the water was standing on sort of black uh, rubber membrane it looked completely bottomless so people were just fairly unsure um, as to what it was they were encountering <clears throat> Um, this is quite a recent project, or actually, it's the very first sketch to find a recent project. It's an installation that is still on view at the Barbican in London. And um, <clears throat> this is uh, something that we talked about years ago, this sort of that idea of the infinite sunrise and the infinite um, sunset merge together into a continuous moment, almost like the like a utopian dream made possible by technological advancement. And what was quite nice is uh, when a um, curator of the Barbican approached us um, for this space that is called the Lightwell, uh, just because, of course, the Barbican in itself is no as this utopian dream. So we thought that this would be, um, yeah, this is sort of the perfect dream location for this installation. So what we are using here is um, a photographic slide film um, that is very, 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 uh, very slowly rotating. And through that, you can see maybe right on the top, there is the roller. And very much on the bottom, there's also a roller. And this sort of sunset um, pierces the bridge of the Barbican that leads from the car to the main exhibition uh, space. Uh, so its uh, total height is uh, 12 meter, which means that this um, slide film continues. Slide film is about 24, um, which is, I think, the longest <laughs> slide film that I have ever exposed. Um, it took a lot of uh, convincing and working with the photo lab to get there. What we thought was interesting here is using a photographic medium that is, of course, often used to record reality to create a certain kind of reality. So here you can see a little clip of how it would continuously change. And this simply by overlapping by kind of overlapping two slides and binding it into a loop. So gradually the color shifts and shifts and shifts. You can see it's a, <laughs> a bit of a time lapse here. Um, quite often in any of our work that might use um, motion, uh, we uh, but tend to uh, aim for that moment where you're not entirely sure if something is changing um, but if you encounter it over and over again then you may you may see the change um, which is really unnerving when you come back to have another look at your own work because you're constantly oh no 
it's not moving, shit, it's broken. But um, this, actually this swap has been installed for a year and um, it's, uh, yeah, still there, still moving. Um, what we were quite happy with was that even though it was kind of, or it is probably almost monumental work today, it has a completely ephemeral quality entirely, sort of fleeting, as it's still completely transparent also. <coughs> And as a place, um, or the place where it, it was installed, it was also quite nice in the sense that it references um, the different um, discipline and what's uh, to be seen at the Barbican. So you have uh, the theatre, in some way it's uh, you know, a, a backdrop in your everyday life that transforms maybe life into a stage. Um, then it was also a reference to sort of first um, yeah, the Victorian panoramas that were sort of moving to show people the countryside. So we sort of uh, tilted that 90% to, I guess, to create the, one of the most universal <laughs> um, nature phenomena. <clears throat> Uh, this is on the bottom, which um, where the film sort of slowly rotates and can be adjusted because um, we're over a year, so there's a little bit of adjustment and running to do. Um, and at the same way, it kind of references the uh, printing presses and processing presses from where we saw the sort of tradition of backdrops and printing and panoramas uh, originates from. Um, this is a small scale that related installation where well, uh, our aim was to create this kind of uncertain structure which um, doesn't move, but uh, of course if you move, it sort of changes. So we're using a similar f photographic slide film when you were sort of moving around the structure. It at the uh, same time changes um, <laughs> color and um, and shape. So it's uh, you can see here it's um, kind of a, quite a transparent material. So you're not entirely sure what it is actually that you see in front of you. If it is some kind of gas that is changing <laughs> and um, yeah, we're looking to make this into a slightly bigger installation where you just sort of try to navigate then your way through this ever-shifting environment. <laughs> yeah, it's called the, or the reference to the physical sky, <laughs> like one of the settings you know, that you have, for example, in Cinema 4D which I find such a, a strange um, well, attitude to your, around, to your surroundings, the fact that you just can implement a physical sky and change the so, uh, north, south, west, uh, in whichever way you please. It just seems the ultimate commodification of our surroundings, so this work is made. Uh, in reference to that. You know, so this is when you look at it from the side, so it's really, it's uh, basically non-existent. It's almost a little bit like putting a, t a texture onto any object that can be changed um, at a whim. Um, similar, similar series. What else do we have? Um, what we are quite interested in is the sort of the question of belief, what can happen, um, what cannot. As I mentioned before, our practice is very much driven by a lot of experiments that we do um, in, this, um, in this studio. 
So here we were experimenting with um, light sources and some lenses, and we were quite intrigued by a sort of statement that, of course, everybody knows that it is scientifically proven that light cannot bend. Um, but in this experiment, it seemed suddenly possible. So we created this um, installation that uh, well, was called Suspension of Disbelief, i.e. if you believe that it's possible, it's uh, impossible. And of course, it isn't really an arc. It is um, just that the different sort of parallel rays of light are broken in slightly different angles through what is a, a, yeah, a Fresnel lens. Um, <coughs> I think there are some other uh, installations related that we're working on. Then the next group of work we are going to show you is uh, was inspired by Edwin Abbott, Abbott's novel Flatland. The story describes a completely two-dimensional world that is um, inhabited by geometric figures. Women are simple line segments, men are polygons. <laughs> and at one point in the story, which is this point, there's a deity that passes through the plain of flatland. And the deity is um, a sphere, which means that it appears to the inhabitants of flatland like a circle of varying dimension, which they can't make any sense of. So um, well, this is um, a novel is, um, seems to have been inspired know a lot of work on different dimensions, which is Einstein, and for us it was quite a, yeah, an interesting starting point to see how we could um, convert uh, opposing um, geometrical shapes into maybe one um, three-dimensional object. Um, this is a suspended sculpture, but um, well, actually it's quite uh, interesting how I guess a, a lot of our work sort of hangs in between different categories, like sculpture, installation, uh, very often has in some ways um, like a time-based uh, component um, to it. And this work in particular is called um, Dark Matter, and it's a uh, black volume that's about two and a half meter um, high. Um, but when we show it, we typically uh, construct a space around it with one entrance. That means the way you encounter the sculpture at first, and also the space is quite dim. 
So the way you encounter it at first sight is to see that you think you're looking at a black hole. Because your eyes slowly need to get used to the surroundings, you new light levels, so at first you can't actually make out um, that it is a three-dimensional object, yet when you sort of depart from that um, entrance point, it's, um, yeah, it seems to sort of shape shift. And from a certain perspective, it then looks um, like a, a square, and from another one, like um, a hexagon. So, in a way, we created this completely ambiguous volume that is everything yet um, nothing. The camera is circling around the object. which means it becomes yet more uh, flat. I suppose, in a way, one of uh, our inspirations <laughs> was the uh, monoliths, which, of course, it is very three-dimensional in our case, yet it just sort of uh, seems a slightly non-human-made artifact that's just landed um, from outer space. Um, the dark matter was preceded by squaring the circle, which takes its name from like a, a problem uh, proposed by ancient geometrists, uh, but that I won't go further into, but basically it dealt with the fact that you couldn't inscribe a, a square in the same um, space than a circle in a couple of very simple geometric steps. So again, we thought, okay, that may not be possible in two dimension, however, Maybe possible in three dimensions. So we um, made this sculpture that from one side looks like a square and the other from a circle. And then there are all these different moments um, in between where it's just a black line suspended um, in space. Uh, which are actually my favorite pieces, yet the same in dark matter. So we only have ter terminologies for this really easily, you know, classified shapes as square and circle and hexagon. Yet, of course, the all the other vantage points, all our facets, are as important and as much part of the sculptures, just that we haven't learned to classify them. When you see it, I think uh, at a system, you see how it sort of tips out of the two dimensional paint and becomes this sort of really physical um, object, and it is that there are actually two opposing uh, figures combined in one sculpture. Um, it's, uh, it's a little bit how, um, well, how it emerges in a certain way. You have a look at these two figures, and one sort of um, sees a square, then <coughs> this cone of vision is this four-legged pyramid. Um, the second viewer here um, sees the circle, 
and his cone of vision is literally a cone, so the sculpture in a way emerges in that intersection. And again, um, so it's quite interesting in sort of uh, what we perceive reality to be. You have two people uh, convinced that they're talking about the same thing, yet they, you know, in their mind, it may be a complete opposite. Um, yeah, then uh, <laughs> it was a curator who talked to us about um, this really novel idea for an exhibition of sculpture, and she said, yeah, it's only going to be suspended sculpture. And we're like, ah, because we only then really realized that actually all of our sculptures were suspended. And I think that is um, none of us trained traditionally in sculptures where a lot of our work um, comes out of that you know, um, abstract space of a modeling program where gravity doesn't exist and everything um, is possible. So with this work, um, <clears throat> yeah, um, I think where we were going with this work is to see um, how we can develop it further from this sort of abstract space. Um, where um, a work that's really a window doesn't only look out into white and white um, to see where else we can bring it to find a space for it. And this, of course, is only um, like a render where you can sort of go, go that one step further where you find a landscape that maybe also views opposing points and uses the sculpture as a window towards that landscape. <clears throat> um, yeah, this is a um, work called uh, Continental Drift. And um, yeah, well, one thing, of course, um, about uh, well, uh, thinking how the world is made up is mapping, something that we have always been quite interested in. It's one of our... Um, um, inspiration throughout is uh, a lunar moon from 52 and um, it depicts the uncharted uh, area of the dark side of the moon because up until then um, yeah uh, that side hasn't been had been hidden no from view um, thing is so that I think quite a lot of maps are still drawn up in that traditional um, vision. In another one is an antipodean globe, probably more familiar, but yes, of course, there is no, um, there is no uh, up and down and source and north um, out there. So uh, my maps are, uh, I guess, one of the most subjective power tools in the history of man. So we were quite interested to see how we could shift that and how we could make a map that didn't have that typical north, south, east, west, divide. I mean, I guess um, all nations tend to, if possible, place themselves in the middle of the map when commissioning them. So we were quite interested in how that could be eradicated. This is a um, uh, work that uh, has this little faceted globe, as it were, um, where the cutout of the different continents ever so slowly rotate around an axis, which isn't no, the usual axis of the world. And the result of that is that the center of the map is continually changing. Yeah, then sometimes there's Africa in the middle, then Antarctica, and also how unfamiliar something that we know so well suddenly becomes it is if it is framed in a yeah, in a different way. One of my favorite things with this work is something that we have with quite a lot 
of our works. We plan everything out so very carefully, um, but then we install things, and it's ultimately left you know, to the space, maybe to the people who are taking care of it or not, in so many ways, in the ways I might be relaying the story. But this was actually particularly interesting in the way that I don't think I have an image of it, but um, <laughs> there were some spiders going to work. And I thought it was so beautiful that like some creature had decided to draw some new borders and invent some new countries. And it seemed so much more organic than <laughs> some borders that have been created <laughs> by men. Yeah. Yeah, so it's projected onto the ceiling. This is still during building, <laughs> uh, during the building phase of the building. But yeah, it looks a bit like a little would make, again, like something that's come in from out of space. Um, yeah, some of our work, of course, deals with um, how to relate with um, the way technology influences our life that is so ubiquitous that so much of it is um, driven by algorithms. So what we are doing in uh, these works, which some of you might have seen, um, is we are laying uh, some very simple algorithms starting with cellular automata, and then we have developed it a little bit further and further and further by hand. So literally almost uh, yeah, going back to the very beginning of computing where um, maybe the first computer was a room full of people making calculations. Um, um, the reason why we are uh, using dice here uh, to reconstruct these uh, patterns is, well, initially Einstein <laughs> said, no, God doesn't play dice with the universe. So here is a little bit of a question for us <laughs> if, um, yeah, if there, if there is an underlying system behind it all, we are just in some time, some more able to recognize them and others just look like cares to us, where some of these are a little bit more um, recognizable. And of course, they also no, appear everywhere in nature. <clears throat> yeah, these works were calculating the universe. So a simple introduction of a horizon in the image pane we have opposed uh, some more chaotic and some more constructed um, patterns, where the difference between the two is li literally one change in, well, in eight varieties. Oh, yeah, this is a slightly more complex one with this, uh, trigonomic dice simply because these were really the first uh, dice that um, were ever used um, by mankind. And we quite like this idea of a dice being a symbol of fate that is no more and more taken over by some algorithms where it's here we have then taken that symbol and um, restricted it to like ones and sixes only. So it's become more and more uh, uh, a game of winners and losers, and the middle drops out a little more. <clears throat> um, these are some tapestries that we have made, um, simply because we were quite interested by the relationship of uh, tapestry and the jacket loom uh, being the first you know, coordinate um, system, and wanted to revisit that. Um, and then we have, let's try to bring it into three dimension, written some very simple programs. And that is the very first step. But then, of course, um, uh, yeah, to make them is a very different thing. So this is a small, small sculpture that we have made uh, in uh, aluminum, where we have then sort of slice the entire sculpture to 
to um, yeah to get the different layers and mounted it um, together again, um, which is a, fr a very different feeling that you get from an object on a screen or here in its more physical form, and also in its in its weight because it's incredibly <laughs> heavy, as said. Yeah, oh, this is a double. I think maybe that is partly where this compression loss series came from. Um, well, here we have sort of taken that idea of slicing and taking everything down into little bits and pieces and deconstructing it um, with uh, a slide that I see uh, to uh, a group of mythical sculptures so that we have cast in different slabs and then sort of re, uh, recon uh, reconstructed in slightly um, different ways. This is Venus, of course, is Toth, the uh, god of magic. <coughs> Cheaper. Um, there's the, there's almost a bit of this idea that you have that you maybe tend to now remember certain bits of things, um, I don't know, maybe in the way they attack and the way they, you, that you can always um, take them, find them back. But somehow, or at least my memory seems to be a lot more fragmented, maybe because I know I can rely uh, on that extended memory of the internet or whatever else. Yeah, and these were shown in front of um, these coffee tapestries that were based on like, um, like a search algorithm that called the labyrinth of a straight line. Um, the straight line being maybe sort of the straight line of scientific inquiry, but here with these um, works, which uh, are all based on one single line that is traced around the entire can canvas to find the old, um, sort of to fill out all these different cells of a canvas. Um, we're basically wondering in how far you create a territory through your searches, I, in a similar way that maybe your searches in general on the internet or wherever else are um, you know, predetermined by the ways that you have or by what you have previously searched for. So this is one way, um, yeah, what we found interesting. Uh, to reflect on huh. again. Um, this work is called on all colors white. Um, we are quite struck by the way that um, you know, all the information that is given to us in a way um, is presented to us in this sort of RGB format. What we have try to do is to, in a way, remove the image plane so the light itself um, yeah, becomes uh, the main thing, I think. So what you saw before were like three LEDs, red, green, blue. And um, we were quite interested in um, yeah, cutting that light um, in a really, really physical way. So by rotating these <coughs> shutters um, in front of it, the totality of the light sometimes falls within that same space in the middle. And at other moments in time, it gets sort of split out into, uh, yeah, into this completely non-definable color spectrum. But yet what you see is always um, exactly the same. We're just completely unable um, to perceive it, I think. And uh, yeah, I think I might close with that. <laughs>